All right, so let's go back and kind of review where we were at last time. And last time we had an informal definition of a limit. And we were looking at the limit as x approaches a of f of x equaling l. And we had to decide when does this limit exist and what? When does this limit what? Not exist. So let's recall a few things. First off, f had to be defined around some interval containing a but not necessarily necessarily and by the way whenever I misspell a word on the board please spell it right in your notes to make me look smarter all right um, necessarily at a so we have a function is defined around a and we're interested in what what happens at x equals a that's the interesting thing all right then what happened we hit there so what did we have again so whenever we were near a f of x had to be within a certain a certain range of l and i'll draw the pictures here and kind of point out what this really means we have a function we're interested in what happens in a and we're saying it looks like these values are going over to what l all right, and we want to know if we're going to limit's going to be L. Well, it really says this. You give me a target, and let's say my target is a little number here. We go within that amount of our limit. Then we should be able to come over here and find the corresponding interval down here. So let me see if I can draw this in nice and neatly. Oops, go away there. Now let me get a different color. So let me just kind of do a dotted line over here. Dotted line over here. And it looks like if I take any x value that would come down, let me come down here, let me come down here. I take any x value in that interval, will it, its function value be close to this L? It will be. All right, so it says you give me a target, I can come down here and find a target. You know, if you want to make it narrower, we could make it narrow. Well, what's going to happen down here? We're going to make it narrower as well, right? And as long as we can stay within that. Now, if we went back to that crazy graph we were looking at, at the end of the class, cosine of 1 over x, and then um, what we would have discovered was as that function came in, it went what? Up to minus 1, back to 1, back down to minus 1. So let's say you think it's going to be 0. You say the limit's going to be 0. Well, you have to find values that always stay within 0. Let's say I'm going to pick a very small target from there to there. Well, you'd have to back it up and find that. Well, what happens? This keeps going back and forth, so it will always bounce outside that range. So you can never narrow down that target. That's why that cosine 1 over x graph has a lot of craziness to it. So, okay. And then we had one theorem I, I said, but I didn't write up formally. And this is called, in this book, it's called, the, um, I'm just going to put it as the relationship relationship between one-sided and two-sided limits. Um, the limit above was called a two-sided because we had to what? Be able to come in from what? Both directions. All right. And it says this. 
the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l if and only if. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start introducing you some of you to notation. I know how to spell if. IFF is if and only if. It is like a double arrow. It goes both ways. So anybody seen that if spelt this way before? All right, a couple of you. So I know how to spell if. There's lots of other words I can't spell, but if I can. All right. The limit as x approaches a from the positive side of f of x equals l, and the limit as x approaches a from the negative side of f of x also equals l. The double-sided limit only exists if both single-sided limits exist and they're the same value. Okay. So, if you think this limit might be tough to do, you might look at these two limits and see if they agree. If they agree, you know that limit exists. If they don't agree, then you know this limit, what, doesn't exist. Okay. Give you a chance to get that caught up, and then we're going to work an example. And then we got a handout to do yet today before we start the next section. All right, so let's take a function here. f of x equals the absolute value of x minus 1 over x minus 1. What is the most interesting point to think about? x equals 1, right? And why is that? Because x can't be 1 because thou shall not divide by what? 0. So what we're interested in is the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. All right. Well, absolute values have some unique properties. And let's just recall, I'll have you crank out some absolute values here real quick for me. Find me those two absolute values, preferably without calculator. I'll be watching you. Make sure you don't use your cell phone and Google this one. Right. If I had chalk, I caught you throw, I'd throw chalk at you. I caught you Googling this one, but I don't have chalk. Well, what's the absolute value of 2? Two? 2, right? What's the absolute value of negative 2? Two? 2, right? And absolute values always put out what a positive answer. Well, it's really what? The distance from 0. Distance can be 0 or positive, not negative. Now, how does it change a negative into a positive? It changes its sign. The definition of absolute value that we like to use in mathematics, especially at this level, is the absolute value of x equals either x, if x is greater than or equal to 0, just fits out the same number because it didn't change its sign, or it changes its sign if x is what? Less than 0. Well, if I'm less than 0, I'm negative, and the opposite of negative is what? Positive. That's why this works. All right, so let's look at the absolute value of x minus 1 then. Well, when would this be 0 when x is what? 1, right? Because 1 minus 1 is 0. So this would be if x is greater than or equal to 1. I don't care what number you put in. What's it going to spit out? x minus 1. Let's just check. Um, Caleb, I see you're nodding your head. Give me a number bigger than 1. 2? Lack of originality, but let's go with 2. What is 2 minus 1, class? 1. Absolute value 1? 1. Oh, 2 minus 1 is what? 1. Does that spit out the same 1? It does. All right. And then what's it going to be? It's going to be the opposite of that if x is what? Less than 1. All right. Tristan in the back. See, I learned your name now, Tristan. Give me a number less than 1. Zero. Zero point something? 0 0.5. Okay. Ooh, I like this. 0 0.5 minus 1 is what? A negative 0 0.5. What is the opposite of negative? Excuse me. What is the absolute value of negative 0 0.5? 0 0.5. Oh, let's put in negative 0.5 in here. Uh, 0 0.5. Point, you said 0.5, right? Yeah. 0.5 minus 1 is what? Negative 0.5? 
And what's the opposite of negative 0 0.5? 0 0.5. So that it works. Now let's just clean this. No, we'll leave it like that. Okay. So now let's look at two one-sided limits. Let's look at x approaches 1 from the positive side of f of x. Okay. So if I'm coming in from the positive side, the 1, am I bigger than the number 1 or less than the number 1? Bigger. So I'm at the upper definition. So this will become the limit as x approaches 1. And let's see here. What's another name for the absolute value of x minus 1? x minus 1. And then remember, what was our denominator? Go all the way back to our function. What was the denominator of our function? x minus 1. All right. The other Tristan. What is x minus 1 divided by x minus 1? One? 1. Excellent. He didn't even use toes. Now, if you think about that, what is that line? That's a horizontal line. And what do you think the limit of 1 is? 1. All the function values put out 1. It's a constant function. Okay, now let's look at what happens on the other side of 1. i got to change batteries here in a second. Let's look at the limit as x approaches 1 from the negative side. Well, then we would have to use what? We'd have to use the lower half of that definition. We would use the lower half of that definition. So we'd, that would go in there. And we'd still have that x minus 1. Well, what happens? x minus 1's cancel, leaving behind a 1, but we have that negative sign. We get the limit as x approaches 1 from the negative side of negative 1. Well, those values are pretty easy. They're always a constant, right? Whatever you put in that function, what's coming out? Negative 1. Okay, Brian, is 1 equal to negative 1 today? No. no, or ignores any other day of the week, hopefully. So 1 does not equal negative 1. So the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x does not exist since the one-sided limits are not equal. All right. Let you get caught up there. And then we got some, this is the graph I did fun yesterday at the photo conference. Didn't even post it. It was like this to be reorganized. Oh yeah, you even graphed it on GeoGebra. We're gonna do that next. Mm -hmm. Everybody get one? Sorry about that. Miguel, right? See, at least I learned your name by not doing that, so. All right, let me uh, turn, get this page open here real quick, this handout open. Okay, so the first thing we have here is we have the graph, you know, it's y equals g of x. That means what? All the y coordinates are, are what? The outputs, the inputs are the x's. And we have these problems here to go through. So I want you to spend oh, a good five, ten minutes. Feel free to bounce ideas off with your neighbors and to try these problems. You're reading the graph, you're paying attention to the notation. And you can't ask your neighbor. If you want to partner up, you can partner up. We'll let you look at the notation first. If you're struggling at it, well, that just means we gotta pay a little more, we gotta work a little harder at it, all of us. And I imagine some of us will be struggling a little bit. It is fairly new.
Yep, feel free to bounce ideas off your neighbors. And I'll give you about five minutes longer to work on these. Play nice together. I'll be right back. A few more minutes. I like to some people are working together on these, bouncing ideas off each other. We're just doing the top problem. Don't try the bottom problem yet. So. Eight eyes, yeah. All of them. As many as you can, Magnus. So we're going to go through them. You don't get to make up many of these. You're probably hard to make up, so I don't have many of them to print it out. So I'd like you to try them first. Got him? Feel like so. I think so, all right. Did you have calc before in high school? Pre calc. All right, we'll get started here. Just as soon as I see what email I just got. Okay, so let's go through these problems. And so we have this graph here. And so let's look at this first. I don't need a stick. So let's look at this first one here. G of <coughs> All right. Bear with me just a second. Thank you. 
Every once in a while. Do, 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 do. Trying to close it so I can reopen it. Bear with me just a second. Worst comes worse, I do magic tricks. I, I bet you don't believe I could put a hole in this paper big enough to put my body through it. I mean, it's tricks easier as I've lost like 50 pounds, so, but. Uh, all right, we're getting closer now. I just got to figure out why. Okay. Sometime I'll show you how I can, I'm a contortionist. All right, so let's go through this first problem. Now let's see my pins writing. All right, shouldn't have uh, changed batteries. I got, oh, I wonder if I just put it in wrong orientation. There we go. Okay, operator. So G of one, G of negative one. So what is that saying? That's saying All right, I have no idea what's going on right now. So it's like did somebody else like Bluetooth in on my device or something when I was out of the room? All right, so G of negative one. That's saying, hey, the X is negative one. What is what the Y? So I go to negative one. What's the Y coordinate? Well, the Y coordinate's not two, the Y coordinate is what? Three. So g of negative 1 is what? 3. That's simply, hey, here's the x, what's the y? The next one, the limit, let's go to b here, and on b, what do we have? We have the limit as x is approaching negative 1 from what? The negative side. So we're approaching negative 1 from what? The negative side. And what is happening to these function values? These function values are getting closer and closer to what value? The value 2. So that one would be equal to 2. Everybody see that? All right, then this next one, the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the positive side. So the positive side is this side, and we're approaching negative 1. So it doesn't even matter about here. We've got to get close to negative 1. So we're here, we're getting closer to negative 1. And what are those y values going to? They're also what? Going to 2. And what are those called again? One-sided limits. Those are the, same, the, the two one-sided limits going into negative 1. Are they the same? They are, right? So what is this down here? This is the two-sided limit. So we already know that is going to be what? 2. All right, the next one, g of 1. That's saying, hey, x is 1, what's the y-coordinate? When x is 1, what's the y-coordinate? Is it 2? Oh. I see it now. I got a little, I almost missed that. Yeah, so I, that, everybody see the dot there that's kind of hidden behind a thing I can't get rid of right now? So that's what, too. I thought it was going to be undefined. Thank you for catching that. And then the limit as x approaches 1. So as we approach 1. Well, as we approach 1 from the left side, from the negative side, where are those y coordinates going to? They're going to, what, 4, right? From the positive side, where they're going to? 5. Does 4 equal 5? No. So what we say here, uh, it's right up here, does not exist. Now, let's look here. If a limit does not exist, explain why. So how do we explain why? Caleb. Yep. And one of the easiest ways is just to say, hey, because the limit is um, x approaches 1 from the negative side, what would that be? 4? And the limit as x approaches 1 from the positive side is what? 5, and 4 does not equal 5. Or you could say the one-sided limits are different values, but somewhere along the way, you should tell me why, just like Caleb did. 
All right. Then the next one is x approaches 3. So that's a two-sided limit. As we approach 3 from this side, what's happening to those coordinates? They're going towards, what, 4. As we're going to 3 this side, they're also, what, going to 4. And so the two one-sided limits do agree. And then g of 5, we go to 5. And g of 5 looks like it's also, what, 5. So, question back there? Missed that one? All right. So, all right. Then what's this last one here? The limit as x approaches 5 from the negative side. So we've got to come into 5 from the negative side. So that's a one-sided limit. So we're on the graph, and we're going into 5. What do those y coordinates look like they're going to? 5. Okay, so in the 2.2 uh, homework, you have a bunch of reading the graph problems to begin with. So, all right. So now, let's go to the next problem on this. All right. So I want you to go to that next problem. I want you to go to number uh, 28. And on 28 there, what I want you to notice is they've given us a bunch of given information. And what do we have to do? We have to try to draw a graph that what fits that given information. Now, will the graphs be exactly the same? No, because you can have some twists and turns in there. Other than that, you should have these characteristics. So, um, it's 10 o'clock right now. Let's take a quick five minute break to get a stretch in, and then I want you coming back or starting to try to figure out number 28. And you should look, what are they giving you there? They're giving you like f of one equals zero. What is that gonna be? That's gonna be what? A point. And then they're giving you some limits. So I want you to try to wrestle with that first before we kind of talk about it. All right, so let's take a quick five minute stretch and then you can get on that problem. And I can figure out what's going on with my Surface Pro tablet right now. Oh, I took a snip. What's that? No. Nope. nope. We're not going to go that. It's actually easier to try not without graph paper. I, somehow I took a snippet and I was drawing on the snippet. I didn't even know how I opened the snippet up. Because I didn't write on the original document. So, all right, good. Get your stretch, then work on that problem. And bounce ideas off of each other. You can probably guess, I think you got number 29 as homework. I think so. You, I think you have at least one of those problems as homework. There's another one for you to try on uh, chat GPT. It, yeah, the graphs are still, it, they're just a few generations out, I bet. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I chatted with a bot last night on DirecTV. And the first bot was so so, the second bot grammar was terrible. And then I think it took me three bots to get it new. You know they're not human because they type too fast. It's like humans would no way somebody's typing that fast back. So. Yeah, but, yeah, but they would have had to think about the response and and it was almost instantaneous.
Uh, well, they still have similar characteristics. They're not, they're not match up for You can draw several ones that will fit that. Okay, I haven't drawn two of yours, so. Give you a few more minutes to try this, and then we will go through a solution of this. A few of you are still discussing it. Give me a couple more minutes and we'll go through it. Just we're just doing twenty-eight. I suspect twenty-nine is on your homework assignment. I felt like we should do one to practice first. And I obviously just photocopied this straight out of the book. I'm not sure if this is the same book, even. It probably is. All right, so let's do this. So let's go through here. First thing is, what does this tell me? F of 1 equals 0. That tells me I have a point, what? 0, 1 on the graph. Then the next one, 2, 4, says, hey, we got the point, what? 2, 4 on the graph. And the next one, 3, 6. F of 3 equals 6 means we have, what? 3, 6 on the graph. Yes, it should be 1, 0. Thank you, Marissa. And I often make mistakes, so I prefer you catch them early. So, all right, so we got three points. Then what else do we have? We have, what, a one-sided limit. The limit as x approaches 2 from the negative side of f of x equals negative 3. Now, I like to often write down my given information again because it kind of helps me, my brain process what the given information is. As I was writing that down, I was going to myself, oh, this is a one-sided limit, just opposed to looking at it. And then we also have the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side of f of x equals, what, 5. So that's our given information. Um, these are what one-sided limits and they're not equal so we know what we're going to have something funky going on around what x equals 2. 
All right, so let's kind of build a rough draft of this. And so I will kind of do a little bit of a grid. So one zero is there. Two, one, two, three, four. Two fours up there. And we don't do a lot of hand graphing, so we don't need to go out and get graph paper. Three, six. It's got to be about what? There. Five, six. So six, four. And so let me just label these points again. This is what? One, zero, two, four and three six okay now what do we have to do again we have to make sure these one-sided limits as we go into two um, are negative three and five so notice they're not going to match up with x equals two at all right because what is the x at x equals two what's the value four so one's got to go into negative three from the what left side the neg for the negative side so we, let's get negative three in here and so here's negative three here's negative two I gotta make it open why do I have to make it open because I already got a point up there it violate what the vertical line test for functions remember that vertical line test which you wished you had a whole test on in college algebra it comes in handy when you're doing these graphs. Always run the vertical line test. Now, I just got to make sure I come in that limit. Some of you might have something like this. Anybody have that? Some of you might have something like this. I know Alicia does, right? Um, and as long as it's coming into, what, negative 3 from the left side, it doesn't matter what you have. As long, yep. Yep. Oh, there should be, excuse me, good catch there, Magnus. There should be another hole right there because of that. Or better yet, I missed that. I didn't make my dot big enough. What if I just come like that? That would make more sense in that case. I forgot about that third point. So if you did something like the previous, Magnus was kind enough to point out, I should have a hole because I violated the vertical line test all right and then let's see we got to go to what five from that side and so since i got to go through that other point and here's five looks like it's going to do something like that there that would probably be the easiest version um, so questions on that one these are a little bit more of a concept one and so I don't, you don't get a lot of these to try, but do give them a good try because they build up some skills. So, all right. So that concludes section 2.2. Now let's move into 2.3. And we'll definitely be wrestling on 2.3 for this class and Friday. And I haven't opened up the 2.3 homework. We have homework due, what, Thursday night, either as a scan or what, bring it to class on Friday to turn in on paper. And on Friday, what are we going to do? We're going to start off with homework questions. So bring your questions with you. And then we also have homework due, what, Sunday night over section 2.2. So if you can't post it, bring it to class on Monday. All right. So let's move into 2.3. Techniques of limits. Why we like to look at graphs early on to get an exposure to what limits are doing. We like to look at the doing the numbers and our, making our conjectures like we did in 2.1 with the physics problems. Eventually, we like to move beyond that because we use the limits a lot and we need some faster techniques. And that's where we're starting here. All right. So the graphical approaches, so, so far what we've done was we did a numerical approach. That was section 2.1, where we built the table and then estimated the speeds off the table. And that was tedious, right? And you got to sit there and do estimations, and that's not a proof, it's just a conjecture. Then we did the graphical approach, which was section 2.2 and you have to have a graph and sometimes more complicated functions it's hard to really get a good graph of even that cosine 1 over x that was hard to get a graph of that because of the limits on the computer 
So now we want techniques, things we can do quicker. All right. So let's start off with one of the most simplest things we know a lot about. Limits of linear functions. So let's look at linear functions, which is what? f of x equals mx plus b. And so let's look at the limit as x approaches a of f of x. And we're still going to do a little bit of a graphical approach to justify this. Um, later in this chapter, we'll do a, a rigorous proof. So we know we have a line. Oops. We have this line here. We know this point here is what? 0B. And let's come out to some value A. And A can be anywhere. I'm just going to put it there because we need a value there. And then let's come up to here. This point would be A, and then what would its Y coordinate be? M of A plus B, because all I did was replace A in for what? The X. Okay. So, let's see here. As we approach A from this side, as we approach A from the negative side, what's happening to those Y coordinates? Well, what are they happening as we approach A from the negative side? The limit as X approaches A from the negative side, oops, not a negative one, just a negative, of F of X. Well, what does it look like those function values are approaching? Looks like they're approaching what? MA plus B. As we approach the limit as x approaches a from the positive side. Well, what happens there? I'll even get a different color out here. Ooh, stardust. There's some stardust for you guys today. All right, and let's come down this way here. Does it also look like they're approaching a m a plus b? It does, right? That's not a rigorous proof, but it's an intuitive proof. Now, is m a plus b equal to ma plus b. Are those one-sided limits equal? They are. So what does that say? That says the limit as x approaches a of mx plus b equals ma plus b. Let you get that copied down, and then we'll put a term to it. Or we could say the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals f of a, where f is a linear function. And what this really says is, hey, we can do direct substitution for limits of linear functions. We can just plug in the value. And what we want to do along the way is we want to discover all the functions where we can just plug in the value and make the limit simple. And so we build up our technology. Which functions are we allowed to just plug in the value and say, that's the limit? Turns out lines are the first one. All right. So, and I guess I'll make this an actual formal theorem now. So the theorem is this. Let A, B, and M be elements of the real numbers. This is the symbol for element of and script R stands for the real numbers. So we got three numbers floating around, A, B, and M, and they're all real numbers. So they're not variables. For the linear function, f of x equals mx plus b, the limit 
as x approaches a of f of x equals f of a, which equals ma plus b. So that's nice. We just do direct substitution. All right. And then we have a, two corollaries to this. What is a corollary? A corollary is something that falls immediately off this proof. Trivial cases. First case, if m equals 0. All right, class. What is 0 times a? 0. So we just get out b. This becomes the limit as x approaches a of b. What does it equal? b. And what this really says then, the limit of a constant equals the constant. So if I ask you, what is the limit as x approaches 17 of the number e? Is e a constant? Is e a number? It is, right? 2.718, it's Euler's constant. So what's this limit? E. If I ask you what's the limit as x approaches, I don't know, 1,000 of 17. Is 17 a constant? It is. So what's the limit? 17. And if you think about the constant functions again, what are they? Horizontal lines. So all those y-coordinates are what? Exactly the same. The second corollary of this is if m equals 1 and b equals 0, then the function just looks like f of x equals x. And that says the limit as x approaches a of x, what does it equal? a. All right. So let's crank out some limits. The limit. As x approaches negative 3 of 2x plus 3, and the limit as x approaches 5, oh, I don't know, 2x, oh, I'm stuck on 2x's today. Let's go with 3 minus 4x. Go ahead and do those limits for me, please. All right, so what do we do? We peek inside, we look at the function. 2x plus 3, is that a linear function? It is. Does that make us happy? Absolutely. All we do is we put in, what, negative 3. So that becomes 2 times negative 3 plus 3. And what is that? Uh, negative 3. And if you just wrote the answer negative 3 there, that would be fine because it's a pretty simple problem there. Um, how about this one? Is this a linear function? Yeah, so we just do direct substitution. So this becomes 3 minus 4 times 5. 4 times 5 is 20. 3 minus 20 is what? Negative 17. So linear functions, no problem. Direct substitution. And we're uh, reiterate this again. We want to build up all, know all the functions where we can just plug numbers in because that's the easiest ones to do. All right. So... The next thing we need to do is expand on the limit loss. We don't have a lot right now. We, have, we know we can do direct substitution of a linear function, and we know the limit of a constant is what? A constant. So we want a bunch more loss. All right. So we need some te terminology to so, so far. So let f and g be functions 
such that the limit as x approaches a of f of f of x equals l, the limit exists, and the limit as x the limit of f of x as x approaches a equals we'll call it m so we got two functions floating around oh that second function should be called g sorry about that um, and both of their limits exist as we're going into what the same point a So we have we know this. Okay, so what are our laws going to be? Oh, we need a few more things. Let C be a real number and N be greater than zero and N hang on. I'm going to shorten this and let n equal a natural number. I don't know why the author defines it as n's greater than zero and n's an integer. Otherwise, n's a natural number. Okay, so we got a th few things floating around here. We got a constant. We got a natural number. We got two limits existing. Okay, so that's our setup. All right, everybody with me on the setup? All right, so our first laws and our first two laws, property one and two, are addition and the subtraction properties. It says this the limit as x approaches a of f of x plus g of x. The limit of a sum turns out is the sum of the limits. So that's nice. And if it works for addition, it also works for subtraction. So f might be like a trig function like sine, and g might be like a linear function. And it turns out we can do both limits individually, and then what? Add them together. No surprises there. So that's properties one and two. Third property. And you don't have to know which property is which. You just need to know how to use them and that they exist. So I'm not going to ask you what's property number three of the limit laws. All right. Um, this is called the constant... multiple. It says this, the limit as x approaches a of a constant times the function, well what can we do there? We can pull the constant out. So you can factor out a constant. And you think about that for a second, well that constant is going to be times all those y coordinates, so all those y coordinates are going to the constant times that, so you ought to be able to factor that one out. Fourth property, it's called the product. The limit as x approaches a of f of x times g of x equals the limit as x approaches a of f of x times the limit as x approaches a of g of x. Now I should point out, these limits have to exist to use these laws. So you have to know the limit of f, and you have to know the limit of g to apply that property. If this one happens to be 0, and this one happens to be does not exist, 0 times does not exist is not 0. So they both have to exist to use this. You can't use it to say the limit does not exist. And we'll spend some time on those later on. Um, what comes after product? Product's what? Multiplication. What comes after multiplication? Division. It's called the quotient rule. 
and it says this, the limit as x approaches a of f of x over g of x equals the limit as x approaches a of f of x over the limit as x approaches a of g of x. Except one more thing, what do we always worry about on division? By by zero. So provided if the limit as x approaches a of g of x does not equal zero. Thou shalt not divide by zero. Okay. All right. The next one I want to do is powers. Now we got to remember Rn right now is 1, 2, 3. N's an element of this set here. So they're nice power. 1, 2, 3, not half, fraction powers, things like that. And the power rule says this, the limit as x approaches a of f of x to the nth power. Well, that power is a nice whole number power or natural number power. Turns out you can take that power outside the limit and do the limit of the function and then raise it to the power. Okay, and we have one more limit law, which is oh, what happens if we have a fractional power. I'm going to put out that till tomorrow. But let's go ahead and think about these rules here for a second. So we have a limit of what? A sum of difference is what? The limit of a sum of difference is the sum of the limits. Sum or difference of the limits. That did not roll off very easy. So we handle addition and subtraction. We handle multiplication, and we handle whole number powers. Can anybody think of anything that's only made up of addition, subtraction, whole number powers, and multiplication? In your previous math days, any type of function that fits that category. Adding them up, whole number powers, some multiplications, and there may be even a constant at the end. Oh, a whole big class of functions. Polynomial functions. We think about a polynomial function. Somebody think about it back there? What's a polynomial function look like? Well, it has an a sub n, x to the n, an a sub n minus 1, an x to the n minus 1, an a sub n minus 2, x to the n minus 2, all the way down to what? A constant. All right. So let's just pick on one term. Let's just pick on the very first term there. Let's just look at, because we know the limit of a, pro, a limit of a sum is what? The sum of the limits. Let's just look at the limit as x goes to a, and let me go ahead and use b here just for, so we don't have the same a's floating around. Uh, just that first term, a sub n, x to the n. Now, a sub n, that's a constant. What can we do with a constant? Factor it out. Oops, forgot to factor it out. And, and I rewrote it. Sorry about that. Okay, so I factored out the a sub n because it's a constant. And I'll do an example with concrete numbers here in a second. Now, polynomials have whole number powers like 1, 2, 3, and so forth. So we can use the power rule there and say, hey, we can pull that power out of the limit.
And then this is a linear function, remember? And we just said, what can we do with linear functions? Direct substitution. So we just put in B. So we end up with A sub N, B to the nth power. Would, is that the same thing we would get if we just plugged in B right now? It is. So what does that say? Every term can be of a polynomial, you can factor out the constant, use that power rule, and do direct substitution. So what that says is, hey, if you're doing the limit as x approaches a of a polynomial function, what do we do? Direct substitution, where p equals a polynomial function. So, wow, that just took care of a whole lot of function for us. If you see a polynomial inside the limit, what do you do? Plug in the value. All right, so let's do some limits now. Let's look at the limit as x approaches 1 of 3x to the 4th minus 2x squared plus 7x minus 2. And let's do the limit as x approaches 0, oh, I don't know, 17x to the 5th minus 12x cubed plus 108x squared plus 17. I'll give you a second to wrestle with those two numbers. All right, so we peek inside the limit. We look at what type of functions inside it. What do we notice? What type of function is this class? Polynomial. Do we get excited? Absolutely, because what can we do with polynomials? Direct substitution. And we love it when we can do direct substitution on our limits. So what do we do? We put in one. By the way, does anybody know how you put in one into a polynomial? They don't teach this fact anymore. What's one to any power? One. All you do is add up the coefficients because one any power is one. Three minus two is one. Plus seven is what? Eight. Minus two is what? Six. Did I get, you get the same answer when you put in the one all the way across? Yeah. So that's the cool thing about putting in one. That's why often mathematicians put in one because we can crank it out quickly. All right. Now what's the nice thing about putting in zero? Everything drops out but what? The constant of what? 17. So we love polynomials. Their limits are easy to do because we're allowed to do what? Direct substitution. And it's all about figuring out when can we use direct substitution and when can we not use direct substitution. Polynomials always use direct substitution. Okay. After polynomials, so you study lines first, then you studied quadratics, which are polynomials. And then after polynomials, the next thing you studied were, um, excuse me, started out writing its symbols, rational functions. A rational function, we'll call it q of x, is p of x over, um, no, I got to call it f of x here. Sorry, I'm getting my notation mixed around f of x, and it's going to be a polynomial divided by a polynomial, where p and q are polynomials. Okay. So, if we're looking at the limit as x approaches a of a rational function, p of x over q of x. 
Now, irrational functions of polynomial over polynomial. Well, first off, the limit of a quotient becomes the quotient of the limits. Okay. Now, polynomial limits exist. Uh, that's also a corollary. They always exist everywhere and in any A value because polynomial's domain is what? Minus infinity to infinity. So polynomial limits always exist. So this limits exist. This limits exist. When would this quotient not exist? When, when this limit is zero. Very good. Provided the limit as x approaches a of q of x does not equal zero. So what does this say? You can do direct substitution for rational functions as long as the denominator does not equal zero. All right. That takes care of a lot of functions too, doesn't it? So we already got some direct substitutions built up there. I'll give you a chance to get that written down, and then we'll try an example. All right. So let's take this function here, f of x equals, I don't know, 3x squared plus 3x minus 2 over 4x plus 5. And let's find the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. We're going to keep our number small because we're getting close to the end of the hour. All right. So you look at the function. You look at it. You see the numerator. Numerator is a polynomial, right? We like that. Is the denominator a polynomial? We do. Now, for me, the first thing I do over on the side here, here's me thinking, I like to think, is I just plug in 1 into the denominator. Why did I pick 1? Because that's our limit. Why the denominator? Because thou shalt not divide by 0. So I quickly put in 1. All you have to decide, is it going to be 0 or not? Is it going to be 0? No. So what, what does that do? That makes us happy, because what can we do? Direct substitution. So let's put in 1. Put in 1 for me. I'll get you started. But denominator's 9. You do the numerator for me. I know, Tristan, that was a lot to ask of you. And I already told you how to put in 1, right? Add, add up the coefficients. 3 and 3 add up to 6. Minus 2 is what? 4. So if we were to graph this function, what would we see? We'd see that it's at, as we're going into the x value 1, the function values are going to what? The value of 4 ninths. All right. So polynomials, we can do direct substitution. And by the way, linear functions are, are, are a subset of polynomials. And rational functions, we can do direct substitution as long as what? The denominator is not zero. All right. Well, we have a few more limit laws to do, but they're, the last one's kind of a trickier one because it involves rational roots. And so I don't want to start at five minutes left. Actually, I got four and a half minutes left. So I'm sorry I'm going to let you out early. Please don't report me, but uh, have a good day. And um, let's see, today's Wednesday, so we have no class tomorrow, but class on Friday. And just a reminder for those, um, the Friday before Labor Day, I'm taking off for a wedding. So I thought I was going to be able to leave after classes, but...